I'm here with Annie Marsh of Die Art is Murdered to talk about the upcoming new record, Godlike, out September 15th on Human Warfare. First of all, thank you very much for taking the time to join me on the channel to talk about the record. Uh, how are things going with you? Uh, thanks for having me. Things are going great. Uh, down here in Australia, we're getting ready for the record in about five weeks' time. New song uh, in about a week's time, so it's all happening. Happy the days counting the minutes? Yeah, yeah, sadly. Uh, just sitting here waiting to unleash everything. So I've got little timers on my watch that pop up every day. <laughs> so for you, from your standpoint, uh, how different was working on Godlike versus previous records? What, what stands out in your mind? Many different aspects, you know, from the creative process through to the administrative process. Um, it was the first record we made in four years, so everything felt pretty fresh and exciting, uh, yet the familiarity of experience, you know. Uh, it's our sixth uh, LP and the fifth one with Will Putney at the helm, so everything was running very smooth like clockwork, yet still had a pretty exciting feel to it because we'd had such a nice break. Uh, on the administrative front, it's the first record that we've released worldwide independently. Uh, we'd done that previously for Human Target and Dear Desolation within Australia and New Zealand. I didn't think it would be that much more difficult, but turns out 168 territories is very difficult to do by yourself. So <laughs> it's been a, you know, a challenging year, but Did very exciting. Know, maybe you guys bit a little bit more than what you could chew or looking back now, you're still happy, even though it took that much work, that much effort, you, you're still happy with the end result. Very, very happy with the result. You know, I think every opportunity of discomfort or pain is an opportunity to learn. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot this year and a little bit of hard work now to secure the, the financial freedom and independence for the band for the future, I think, was worth it. When you, when you look at the sound of Diarta's murder, you always want to, as a band, you, I'm sure you want to evolve, you want to push elements, you, you want to bring new influences in. But what is the key ingredient that you know that regardless of how much we change or how much we evolve, that key ingredient has to stay the same? I think it comes down to like the friendship between us. Um, we're all very inspired by one another. We're all very close friends. We've done, I don't know now, over, well over a thousand shows together as a band. Um, maybe closer to 2,000. <laughs> I honestly, I should probably go and count one day and keep a spreadsheet. Um, but I think, you know, regardless of what direction we head in, the, the how, would, how do you say, the chemistry that we have, is the key ingredient, you know, and, and that comes from a foundation of who we are as people and uh, the trust that we have in each other. Is it challenging for a band as as fundamental as Die Art is Murder is for the genre of deathcore? Is it, is it difficult for you to see a way of growing but not disconnecting from that love that the fan base has for what got you guys to this point? No, not at all, really. Um, I think that we... We're very patient in comparison. Well, I don't know how other people feel, but oftentimes I feel that miscalculations in a band's trajectory are due to impatience, uh, either from the label or the management pressure to accelerate the growth of a, of a band uh, or from themselves or from their peers or whatever. We're quite happy just doing what we do and improving. I've said this before, even if we improve 1% per year, we're not trying to become the biggest band in the world overnight, what we try to do is avoid making mistakes, uh, creative mistakes or business mistakes or touring mistakes. Um, it's a lot easier when you narrow down your uh, circle of choices. If we wanted to put singing in, we thought that this would make us more popular or do this or do that or make these stylistic changes. Every one of those changes is an opportunity to make a mistake. So rather than... Uh, then be forced with all of these choices we just keep them very very simple and every record we just have one or two things that we want to focus on for instance on this record we wanted to incorporate some kind of more groovy verses whereas normally it's blast beats and we wanted to have some kind of more simple stompy choruses such as in the last single keras and as long as we just know that those two things will work and we want to incorporate them in our sound then we avoid making too many choices and therefore making running the risk of making too many mistakes. Is your personal growth tied into the growth of the band as an artist? 
I think so, for sure. I think every good artist that what they make is a reflection of themselves. Um, and as we've grown together as individuals, but also as a collection of musicians who are friends, um, you know, I, I think it's it goes hand in hand. Uh, one of the things that I discovered listening to the album is not, not to say the previous records didn't have that, but this album felt a lot bigger sound wise. And I don't mean that in, from a heaviness standpoint. I just mean the sound traveled better. So it it didn't feel like the sound was hitting walls and, and kind of feeling boxed in. It just felt like it had room to breathe. Previous records had that, but not to this extent. Do, do, you, do you see something that perhaps changed that allows that experience to be a little bit more noticeable? Yeah, for sure. There's a few choices that we talked about with Will, our producer beforehand. Like, I think if you go back and you listen to a record like Hate, which is obviously a big fan favorite, it's balls to the wall constantly, which doesn't give this breathing space to hit the wall again. You know, you, if you're just at the wall, you're always at the wall. After five or ten or fifteen minutes, the the you don't get this uh, initial impact again. So learning how to craft the songs to pull them back in a controlled enough manner so that they're heavy, but then we still have room for impact later in the song was one. And then also, I think some sonic engineering choices, you know, Will and I talked about maybe compressing the record a little bit less so we had this room for impact. Um, how to design the sounds as well, which goes to his engineering, like how do we want the guitars to feel or how do we want the drums to feel? that will also aid in in re-delivering impact throughout the song or throughout the record. Certain choices like that, you know, I, I think came to the front. I, don't, I also don't think it's any one thing. I think it's the culmination of all these small choices and, and mistakes that we've learned from in the past 10 years. One of the songs that stood out to me listening to this record was Bermuda. I, I think it's a very unique song has unique characteristics, has a, a unique soundscape, feels very atmospheric at times. It, it was just one of those tracks that when you get to the end of the record or you get to the end of the, the listening experience and you get ready to start all over again, that song leaves a very lasting impact that then impacts the way you perceive the second time around uh, going through the record. Did, did that specific style approach sound uh drive the decision of where you guys were going to put this song towards the end of the record for sure i think there's a, a few elements that play in the in, first in the creation of the song and then in where it goes in the sequence um i always like to will and i always decide the sequence of the record so where the songs will go and we have a little bit of a chat to, about it but generally minus one or two songs we pick exactly the same we put he makes a list and i make a list and we compare and then we discuss anything that we have a difference of opinion on uh that one we did have a difference of opinion on well, one thing that's important to remember is like we do we do have a lot of vinyl fans and we want them or we hope that they listen vinyl fans generally i i imagine they're not skipping through playlists on spotify they put on the side and then if they have enough time, another 20 or 30 minutes, they flip it over and they listen to the other side. But in the event that they don't have enough time, we like the first track one to feel like the start of a record and track five to feel like the end of a record. So if they just listen to one side, it feels like a complete picture. It's why song six for us always sounds like it could be a song one and track five could always be a track 10, like the album closer, so that you have these two chapters with a start and a finish. Uh, with Bermuda, I, it's a curveball song. Sean brought this little MPC program loop that he wanted to bring to the record, which was very different for us. And I was like, it could go track eight or nine so that the second side starts and then comes down and then finishes at the end, or it could go track 10. And Will said, it's so different. Put it at track 10 so the fans kind of sit there and they get to the end, they go, what the hell was that? <laughs> yes, exactly. That's and then when they come to track one, it's crazy again. So, um, yeah, that, that was the only one that we had a difference of opinion on for this record, and we could have gone either way, and I'm very happy that it's at the end. I think it's so different. It has an element of peacefulness and despair that is a, a nice way to close out the record thematically. 
it, it, it closes the record, but it also leaves it as a little bit of a cliffhanger, which then plays really it's... well and going back into the beginning of the album and starting the experience all over again. But it's definitely a track that I'm not going to lie to you. I checked the track list and I was like, I'm sh- are you sure this is not a bonus track? Because uh, I was like, you know, it felt like so different from the rest that I was like, let me let me double check that this is not a bonus track, but it wasn't, and I'm I'm glad that it wasn't. It works really well. Yeah, the design definitely track. not a bonus track. Um, that being and said, we I do have Japanese four... edition, and this is a bonus track. Like I was wondering what's going on. We do have four other tracks that we four or five other tracks that we recorded, and so what we do with those in the future, I'm not sure, but maybe a bonus edition or something. Um, but no, Bermuda is definitely part of the the full experience. It was a a new style, a new approach. I think having the time off, spending more time together, but not on tour, just being friends, um, let us trust each other a little bit more to take chances and do some weird things and present new things. And Sean loves this little NPC thing. He takes it everywhere with him in his backpack and is always making beats. And he was like, oh, I want to use it. And I was like, let's do it. Like, let's go. Let's, let's so, do it. Yeah, n- nice to include that in the experience as opposed to being too cautious and leaving that for a B-side, you know? Uh, when when you look at Diarta's murder, the, the social commentary in the lyrics has always been there with from the start of the band. There's nothing new with this record, but you guys do it in a very creative way, in a way that doesn't come across as preachy. Uh, it, it's just very subtle in terms of the lyrical content, and, and it allows the listener to kind of take the message in, in a multitude of ways, because depending on my own personal baggage that I bring into the listening experience, I may take the lyrics in one direction. You may have a different direction towards that lyrical content. Uh, how important is that lyrical content in the way that you're trying to put something forward that it's meaningful, but at the same time giving the listener room to make its own mind on, on, on what that meaning is? This is something that Will for sure taught me because he's a great lyric writer also. And when when we started making the records, I didn't really set out to be the person who wrote the lyrics. I was the guitar player. <laughs> and uh, it just so so happened that I ended up having to, to write the lyrics. So I did want to have stories and things that were important to me. In the beginning, it was tough. I think you have this ego as a young songwriter, like this is what I wrote the song about. And everyone has to accept that this is the only way that you can interpret it. This is very like narrow minded, I feel like, and also too narrow and targeted approach. So he was like, you can write the song about what you want to write it about, but make it in a way that's approachable to everyone. And so delving more into different themes, story arcs, metaphors to contain the story so that then they have a broader uh audience to to kind of take their own meaning away from the track was super important and also it gives you more options in the songwriting more language to use more lyrical devices uh, as opposed to making it far too literal i mean there are there are songs that are people wouldn't even understand what they're about join me in armageddon for instance is about self-destruction not about nuclear war (laughs) so like we we talk about these ideas and we make lists and then we think about what metaphor we can use to tell the story. So Join Me in Armageddon is about people that may have had self-destructive episodes during COVID, you know, sitting inside, drinking too much alcohol or, or whatnot. And then we're like, oh, uh, you know, an extinction level event for all of mankind is self-destruction. We're just take the story and then put it into this paradigm and then people can take whatever they want from it as opposed to being like i drank too many beers in COVID, and i want you to feel bad for me like you know yeah letting the mind do the work not necessarily just you know force feed people with a spoon uh yeah and growing older and understanding that in the songwriting process i can say what i want to say and get that off my chest and that's enough I don't need everyone else to accept it exactly literally for what it is. I got my enjoyment out of making it and they can get their enjoyment out of listening to it and they don't have to be the same thing. I was with Pat and and Joe from Fit for an Autopsy a couple of weeks ago when they were touring in, in, in Canada. They played the Toronto show. We actually did a channel takeover where they checked out a Galactic Criminal doing a vocal cover of a Diartis murder song. And off the camera, they had uh, nothing but great things to say about you, by the way. Uh, They had just nothing but compliments, not just about you as a musician, 
uh, well, some of the compliments were on video, but they also had some compliments off video uh, about you as a musician, but also as a person and somebody that they really uh, look up to and somebody that they enjoy spending time with. Uh, when you hear stuff like that from your peers, uh, how, how much more important is that than streams on Spotify? Oh, it's the most important thing. I think at the end of the day, who you are as a person is the most important thing. If I made shit music, but I was a great person, like that would mean more to me than being a terrible person that made great music. Um, and then I like to think that eventually the music becomes a reflection of who you are, but I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's always nice to get those comments. Uh, I try to do the best to help as many bands out as I can. So, you know, well, you guys are going to be touring again pretty soon across Europe. So, uh, uh, I, I'm sure they'll have more great comments to to have about you after that. <laughs> next time, next time they roll through Toronto and I see them again, I'll ask them about that tour. Uh, yeah. Let me ask you this about the genre itself. That that for has evolved a lot. Like there's a lot of bands doing different things now than when the genre got started. But I still feel like overall, as the big umbrella of death for a lot of people, still undervaluate the quality of the musicianship, the quality of the bands, and the final product that's put out there. Uh, how do you approach some of those comments and some of that reaction from people that don't give bands like Die Art is Murder its 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 true value for what you guys have done and are doing? I don't worry too much about it, to be honest. Uh, I worry more about my uh, this sort of internal scorecard. You know, do I feel that I've tried hard enough or done my best? Um, has everyone in the band felt? you know good about what we've made and if so then hopefully over time enough people will come to to share the, that feeling about it um, i mean different people different fans listen to genres of music for different reasons i got into listening to heavy music for instance purely from a musician or musicianship standpoint i, I wanted to get better at guitar and i found that that death metal and technical death metal had phenomenal guitar playing and I didn't really care for the songs at all in the beginning, it, even the lyrics or the vocals. I just wanted to listen to the guitar playing and learn those tricks. And then you have other people that don't play an instrument at all and they only care about the lyrics or they care about the breakdowns. So you, ca you can't know how to win everyone over and you also can't decide what it is that they want to enjoy about the music. So all we do is try to focus on what we can do to make it better over time and hopefully bring in enough people that enjoy it, that we are able to have a sustainable career. You, you mentioned the key word there, breakdowns. Every time we check out uh, one of your videos or, or or if I do an album review on the channel, the first thing people comment is, what song has the best breakdown? Like, I mean, like immediately, <laughs> like I barely clicked published on the video and somebody's asking me, what song has the best breakdown? Is there such a thing as too many breakdowns these days? For sure. I mean, for us, people, sometimes if you read the internet comments, they're like, oh, they're not as cool as they used to be. It's like, where's the breakdowns? It's like, here's the problem with breakdowns is that generally the first fret or the open fret, so that you don't have a lot of uh, harmonic variants that you can put into the breakdown, aside from like wacky sound effects or vocal tricks or doing a whole bunch of gurgling over it. Um, and after that, it just becomes a, a math problem. You know, you have 16 subdivisions in a bar and eventually they're all going to be taken up by different patterns. Um, so it's tough for us to make new and fresh breakdowns. Um, I'm not going to lie. It becomes challenging. At, at a certain point, it's like either they develop into or out of groove sections or they become somewhat repetitive to us because we've made so many i think we have 150 songs or so and if you have one or two breakdowns on each of those it's 150 or the 300 breakdowns what combination of breakdowns can you make out of 16 <laughs> note groupings it's very um very difficult so we don't we try we don't really think about forcing them anymore if, if they eventuate in a song then it's generally because they've just evolved that way from a, a, a groove in a verse or a transition to another another point. That being said, there are still some pretty crazy breakdowns on the album. And I was going to say that <laughs> that uh, definition and that explanation that you're giving, it's really uh, noticeable in the singles for the new record. 
there's there, there there was even some moments in the latest single where you feel like there's a breakdown coming and it doesn't really happen. You guys take it in a different spin, which I think it becomes a lot more impactful than the prototypical all oh, here it goes, the breakdown again. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for sure, like when we were younger, and this was also like a time and a place. It was the style. The, there was great bands back then. All Shall Perish, Despised Icon, uh, Job for a Cowboy less breakdowns like pretty immediately in their career. But Whitechapel, everything was always about the breakdown. So we'd verse build up to a breakdown or a chorus and then build up to a breakdown. And then in the, the bridge of the song, we didn't have bridges in Deathcore. We had more big, bigger breakdowns. Bigger breakdowns, yeah. It was always about that. And I, I like looking at that evolution among our peers. You know, Whitechapel is still one of the biggest metal bands in the world and they started 17 years ago or at least my awareness of them 17 years ago they've gone in a different way and so have we and and all these bands and they've they've realized you know how to incorporate the breakdown more uh as like a seasoning on top of the song it's not always about getting to the breakdown also because of that math problem i said if you have four or five breakdowns in a song then it becomes even more challenging to keep them fresh I'm going to say that Andy Marsh is dropping the Salt Bay as a breakdown. You're just doing the little Salt Bay as a breakdown. Just, yeah, it's just a, a little sprinkle on top, you know. <laughs> so so with, with Godlike around the corner uh, and you guys hitting Europe with Fit for an Autopsy, when are we going to see you guys back in North America? And more, more specifically, I'm, I'm in Canada, I'm in Toronto, so I want to know when you guys are coming back to Toronto. Well, uh, hopefully as soon as we can. Our booking agent lives in Toronto, so he should make more of an effort to book Toronto shows. Um, for whatever reason, we haven't made it to Canada as, as much as we used to in the last few years, um, particularly the West Coast. Toronto usually gets a show. Montreal even we've kind of neglected. So it would be nice to get back up there. I'm hoping in the first half of next year, we should we should see a North American tour. One last question for you. When you are on these tours, I mean, they're pretty long, some of them over a month long. And you're on the road for a very long periods of time. Uh, people think, oh, show is great, but there's a lot of dead time and there's a lot of traveling time between hitting every single venue. W what does Andy do to keep yourself just, you know, cool headed, still fresh and still enjoying the whole process of being on the road? Um, I don't know. I just work all the time. <laughs> it's, it's a crazy thing to think about, but I, I love what I do. I love that through my work i get to create opportunities for myself and my bandmates and the crew to do these tours and play great shows and see parts of the world um it's pretty rare that i'll have a day off to be honest i couldn't tell you the last time i had a day off but uh you know when i'm on a tour generally for eight to ten hours a day i'm normally working on booking the next tour and setting it up and you know so that keeps me engaged gives me like a, a position to analyze like our progress and uh and work on the future which is is always nice here i was thinking you'd be playing mario kart or something like that no no no, no. The, <laughs> the last time i played video games was december last year and it's very upsetting actually because i love playing them <laughs> Well, you know, no. you're, you're, you're going to be on tour with Joe, so maybe he can give you a haircut or a beard trim or something like that, you know, at least, you know, give you that maybe. moment. I will say that the best activity that we do have together is we love going out to get a meal on tour. Um, we have these family meals at least a couple times a week where we just go out with the whole crew and pick a restaurant or a bar and go and hang out for a couple of hours. And, and that's that's one of the best best parts of touring best way to recharge the batteries for sure oh, oh, yeah. uh, andy thank you very much for your time today this was an absolute pleasure definitely for me i, I i'm taking this one off of my bucket list i always wanted to chat with you about <laughs> the band and about the record really enjoyed the album so this was more than what i had hoped for so thank you very much for your time oh thank you very much you're very welcome take care man all the best you too Bye bye